While I watched them, I thought of something else John Ingalls said, which every gardener admits ruefully, and every farmer rejoices in knowing. Grass is immortal. I respect grass. I love it, actually, and could spend 15 minutes a day saying complimentary things about it. I love in various seeds and the feel and look of them and the way they flow through one's hands. I respect the way grass comes, unplanted apparently from no place, asking so little. All you need to do is to move a board from the ground or an oil barrel or pull out some weeds and then mercifully protecting grass covers the spot of bare earth and feeds it with its own blades. By grass, I mean clover also. Encouraged, it feeds livestock, which is the beginning of feeding people and essential in maintaining the soil. Grass holds the flesh of earth to earth's bones, which is the beginning of farming and housing, government jobs, business, gymnasiums, schools, churches, music halls, auditoriums, and places for red-winged blackbirds and build to build nests. In one of the oldest readers I can find, Sarah Roberts Boyles speaks in a poem for grass. Here I come creeping, creeping everywhere. Grass provides suburbanites something to take their minds off their problems by giving them something to mow. Without grass, there would never be, never have been any power mowers, and as my music teaching piano playing neighbor Grace Lundy says, nothing has made so much difference in the appearance of the country as the power mower. Without the power mower, even the blessing of rural electricity People would never have flocked to the country in such star starling-like numbers as they have. I love grass for its fragrant fragrance also. A freshly mowed yard smells like a different place. A freshly mowed hayfield, especially one with sweet clover in it, or an upland field in which nature has planted a liberality of field mint or penny royal, is one of the rewards of farming. The frantic days of hay haying is one provide one of the pleasant times for farmers or farm visitors to remember. Degrassing the garden that afternoon I pulled up several handfuls of what I call menthol grass because it smells pleasantly like menthol and I do not know its real name. It has a heavy blade, glossy and bright green above the surface of the ground, and pulls up easily, disclosing the white underground section, thickening as if trying to develop into a bulb. Many other kinds of grass I had pulled up and thrown into the heap for a garden democratically welcomes them all and collects all. I had pulled up elbow grass that makes a new plant wherever its joint touches earth. Nest egg grass that pulled up readily, and although its long seed head looked green in color and immature, it had already ripened a little clutch of seeds that it dropped on the bare ground where they would prosper just that much more because I had removed the parent stalks. The names of grass are beguiling to read, brome orchard grass, which makes fine eating for livestock, but inspires a lawn keeper to profanity on account of its high bulging crown, witch grass, crab grass, and love grass. There are three kinds of love grass, ordinary love grass, sand love grass, and stinking love grass. Best of all, I love grass when it is hay. Let this be a lesson to people who think they will do on Sunday what they didn't get done during the week. Sunday morning was dark and chilly. I was three columns late, so I decided to stay home from church and write them. 
the typewriter was interrupted by the Maple Grove minister who said the fuel oil line was broken at the church's stove. The church was cold, so could they meet at this house, which is the nearest one. Just give me time to get the typewriter out of the living room, I said. Dick was up at the barn doing his morning chores. While the minister went back up to the cold church to summon his flock, I set a quick fire in the dining room fireplace and took out the ironing board. Coming from a chilled building, the people were not critical. Besides, they were all neighbors. The adult Sunday school class met in the living room from whence the typewriter had fled, leaving the games table to serve as a communion table. Fay Baines and Delatha Cowden took their beginner's class to the dining room in front of the welcome flame. The minister's wife convened her teenagers around the kitchen table. Mary Naylor took her in-betweeners upstairs to Carol's bedroom, which fortunately was somewhat in order, having been available to an overnight guest only a few days earlier. When Dick came down from the barn, he was surprised to find himself in church. He had never, so far as I know, attended church in overalls before. This is an old house, and although it has had church parties and church dinners here, it has never had a worship service in it before, as far as I know, and it must have felt privileged. My only regret was that it happened on a weekend when both the farm children were away in school and could not share the honor with us. It was a new experience for the church, too, but this church, organized in 1876, kept young boys by having new experiences. The builders set up a one-room frame building, which has since been remodeled, enlarged with an entryway and basement. It did not have a wedding until it was an old church. Its first bridegroom was a young man, then serving it as minister. Since then it has had several weddings. It has had many funerals and many homecomings, which it calls Big June. On Palm Sunday it held its first ordination. The young man to be ordained was the son of Emmett Baines, a dairy farmer in this community. At that time, the son was a student in the theological school in Tennessee. To the people of the community, it seemed only an invocation's length ago that John Baines was a little earnest, red-haired boy sitting between his school-teaching mother and the witty, dark-eyed, quiet-faced deacon who was his father. This is the pattern of children growing up in little country churches. First the mothers hold the babies on their laps. It is a mark of special talent if the father is able to hold the baby and keep it reasonably quiet during the hour and a half of services. Presently the babies have grown into little boys and girls not quite tall enough yet for their heads to show above the backs of the long gray painted benches on which they sit between their parents and are given something to keep them busy, which may be a Sunday school leaflet and crowned or the mother's purse. Next, they are trusted to sit with favorite aunts or grandparents. At four, a young man will sit in proud, smiling decorum beside the 17 to 30-year-old woman he has already invited to be his wife in the future. Later, he sits with his boy contemporaries and whispers too much. Finally, he brings his girlfriend, and more finally, his wife. At this ordination, surrounded by the affectionate goodwill of neighbors and relatives, John sat next to the aisle beside his wife and held their baby girl on his lap until it was time for him to rise and declare solemnly, I respond to that call and desire to be formally ordained to that work. 
How is a man different after ordination? And at what point does the difference actually begin? Is it at the moment when he kneels at the altar and is touched by the hands of minister and deacons? Is in John's case the hands of his neighbors and his father? The service has the quality of ancient ritual about it. A listener hearing the undertone of usual murmurous human sounds accompanying a country religious service could not help thinking how vulnerable, how pitiable, how needful and weak, and yet how potentially splendid and strong is humankind. The neighbor who made a benedictory prayer at the end of the ordination was obviously deeply stirred. For John, in my thoughts, I had the same reverent wish I would, I would have for my children, my husband, myself, my friends, the people who dislike me, and the people I do not know at all. One prayer differing only in intensity, that he should discover his ability and use it in the way most useful to God and his fellow men, and it follows to his own peace of mind. Levi Oliver, school bus driving farmer, and Bob Judah, commercial artist in IU's geology department and president of the Hoser Hills Art Guild, had asked Mary Naylor if the women of the Maple Grove Church could serve a supper to conclude a soil conservation tour during Soil Stewardship Week in May. The church had been in process of remodeling all spring and was still as unfinished as Schubert's symphony. The raw earth that had been removed to make space for a kitchen and dining room basement under the old one-room frame building was piled up in the yard, but the kitchen was usable. There were as yet no curtains up in at the small basement windows. That were half above and half below the surface of the ground and protected by a half circle of metal set outside like a kind of cup rim. The windows opened inside. We had chairs and the long tables on which we always served big June dinners out in the yard. The council needed the money, so Mary immediately said yes, we could feed the supervisors and country preachers of the tour. They had planned to make a tour to farms on which they would see the benefits of terraces, sodded waterways, farm ponds, contour and strip crop farming, spillways. The country preachers should have no trouble finding text for Soil Stewardship Week, verses showing how the ancient people appreciated water and suffered from lack of it run through the Bible like a creek threading through a green pasture. His soul shall be as a watered garden. He shall be as a tree whose roots are planted by the river. The land languisheth because no man layeth it to heart. The council women appreciate the need of conservation. They were glad to help make other people realize that if the soil goes, we shall all go. They were also appreciating the importance of water. We badly needed rain. Strawberries were not growing to full size. Tomato plants, freshly set in the gardens, were falling over limply and dying. The little sauerkraut plants are turning yellow, remarked the young minister from California, looking at Mary Naylor's cabbages. We expected the preachers to be thirsty after a day's dry tour, so we had made a wash tub full of iced tea. While we prepared the hot rolls, chicken and noodles, green beans, pickled beets, and other accessories before and after the fact of a money-making church dinner, we looked up through the dusty high windows in the dining room and hoped the darkening sky meant rain to come. 
Mary Snooks brought clean white linen tablecloths and bouquets of flowers from home. We set the table prettily because a photographer was coming to take pictures for the local newspaper. Besides, we hoped the ministers would remember the dinner happily and ask to come again the next year. The men ate, talked, laughed, ate more, lingered at the table. The photographer came and took pictures and went away. In the kitchen, the women chatted happily because a small rain had begun to tap against the basement windows. We had carried away the dishes from the main course cut the pies, <clears throat> and were just ready to serve dessert when suddenly the Lord let loose with a full-sized rain. It beat down on the unprotected raw earth piled outside the windows, filled the half-cup protectors, and the half-cups ran over. Suddenly the pressure of muddy water pushed the windows open. Inside, water cascaded into the dining room barely missing the Maple Grove minister sitting at the head of the table. The men leaped up, and two of them tried to close the windows, but muddy water gushed down the concrete block walls, and within a few minutes had flowed across the dining room to the furnace, to the kitchen floor, to the foot of the stairway leading up to the main room. <clears throat> it was muddy water like thin gravy. The women sent the guests upstairs to the Sunday school rooms to wait for dessert to be brought to them, to them there, and the men went thankfully. Then the council women took off their shoes and went barefooted through the two-inch depth of muddy water, carrying plates of cherry pie and glasses of iced tea and cups of coffee upstairs. Everybody laughed about it. The photographer went home too soon, cried Montagaley as she waded past me, carrying a plate of pie in each hand. Barefooted, the women afterward sat upstairs to watch the conservation program. The balance of nature on this earth is very delicate, warned the film at the beginning. Downstairs, said Prevo Whitaker, chairman, you have just seen an example of the perishability of unprotected soil. The Lord couldn't have planned a more convincing demonstration of the need of soil conservation, a now nor a better way to show how farm women combine reverence and expedience to meet an emergency. At one end of the flower bedecked room, John lay, not as I, rem I remember him and prefer to remember him always in clean shirt and overalls, always clean. John, who drove his car into your yard at unexpected times and got out slowly and walked slowly toward the house with a half grin waiting to break into a laugh, expecting a joke and prepared to answer in kind. John, the superb storyteller, acute observer, accurate rememberer, with the keen analytical philosophy and the widespread penetrating love of life and fun. Vigorous John, of, when, of whom his friends said he'll do anything for you or anything to you. He would go to fantastic effort to pull off a joke and could take one of the same dimension. John, who spent money and energy to improve his old house, and when his neighbor said mournfully, I just hope you live to get the good of this, replied sharply. I've got the good of it if I die as soon as I've finished it. He could make quick, angry, erratic decisions. He tore out his good fences without regret when he decided to stop raising cattle and start raising crops instead on his bottom fields. That often got flooded in spring. He said when he had a building problem, he just went to bed and the next morning woke up with a solution in mind. He changed the course of the creek across his bottom fields and tore down good sheds who wouldn't have to pay taxes on them. 
John, who in the days when money was hard to come by and he had a little income of $10 a month from a rented house, stopped and gave two months' rent to a neighbor whose barn had burned at the Crossroads Grocery where farmers met almost as if at a clubhouse and everybody played jokes on everybody else and nobody resented it, John asked for a sandwich, which he always called a savage, and wanted horseradish on it, and they put on so much that the tears streamed down his face while he ate it, but he never let on that he noticed. He said of a friend, a good man, but high strong, he'll go to pieces and fly like glass. When his wife, Leota, was away, John cooked his own meals. I fried eggs, he said, and you can get enough of that. His language was beautiful in its form expression. A canvas terpolin he called a cavernous, and he said once, the truth finally dawned on me. When he was late getting home to supper, Leota kept supper waiting, <clears throat> and she and the two little girls, Audrey and Bertha May, waited to eat with John. John always kissed Leota goodbye when he left. For a long time, when anybody said, How are you, John? He smiled and said, Going in low gear. The neighbors thought he had some premonition of death. He had got his house literally and figuratively in order. He had put in a bathroom and changed the stairway and put in a furnace and insulation and built Leota a little sewing place she had always wanted. At a sale a couple of years earlier, he had finally been able to buy an old Seth Thomas clock, something he had always wanted, and was delighted to find it in perfect running order. He liked to fish. He stocked his ponds with fish. He was big and gentle in strange ways. That last summer, he had told Leota he wanted to get two things done before winter, the to roof the shed on the far hill and to get the creek banks sprayed. He told Leota one morning he wouldn't really care if death caught up with him when he was working alone over on the far hill, and that was where it came to meet him. He never got the creek bank sprayed, but he had almost finished the roof. It was on the same hill where, a year or so before, the tractor and a wagon load of wood had overturned and he came near being killed. That final day, <clears throat> he had eaten his lunch and was still sitting on the ground, leaning back against a tree. From where he was sitting, he had a wide, beautiful view out across his farm, and he was apparently at peace with everything. Something vital, distinctive, and irreplaceable went out of the community when it lost John Dunning. Among the many businesses pendant from farming, like charms from a bracelet, is the livestock sale barn. The auctioneer has usually been a farm boy. Often he still lives on a farm and keeps some livestock there. He must understand farmers. He must know local farmers and be able to call them by name instantly in a crowd. He must know prices and how far to push a bid. He must have a good stock of jokes, even if they are old, such as the one in which he and his assistant hold up a long chain and he says, it's got a crook on each end. Or when picking up some preposterous thing, Nobody is likely to want, he says solemnly. Now, boys, it's not often you have a chance to bid on something like this. He must keep the crowd entertained, hopeful, in a good humor, and relaxed. It's a help if the auctioneer can look, speak, or act like a buffoon, but in reality, he must be sharp. He has to have a good carrying voice and be able to chant hypnotically, so he can do his thinking under cover of his chant. He must speak three languages simultaneously, one to the crowd, one to his assistant, and one to himself. At a livestock sale or auction, the only person who knows more than the auctioneer about what's going on is another auctioneer. There is a new trend in auctioneering now. 
time was an auctioneer went wherever the people lived and sold their farm and household items there. A lunch was served by the women of some church. The new trend is for a well-established auctioneer to build his own sale barn and bring the merchandise there to sell. In these places, the kitchen is an important psychological and economic asset. We stopped one evening to see a new auction barn in a neighboring county on Gene Williams' farm. He had cried a sale that day on a farm where the people were selling everything. His barn, finished only three weeks earlier, was a spacious room, well-lighted, capable of accommodating 300 people in addition to a full day's sale of merchandise. It was clean, orderly, and that evening already full of antiques, gathering for a sale to be the following Saturday. Jean's wife bakes the pies and manages the kitchen at the new barn. Do you ever have anything you're afraid isn't going to sell, I asked, having noticed that when an item isn't going, an auctioneer is inclined to throw in something more and when the bidder takes his purchase home, he often leaves what was thrown in. Even if he is buying junk, a farmer feels a little better if he gets something extra. No, ma'am, Jean said promptly. I never pick up anything that I have any doubt about at all. I have faith that as sure as I'm standing here, I can sell it. And I always do. True, he always does, in his enthusiasm... That evening, he was beginning to forget he was not crying a sale, <clears throat> and he kept addressing Dick and me and his wife and son Billy as people, as he does the sale crowd. How did you happen to become an auctioneer, I asked. He had been a farm boy and considered ring his unmistakable gift for sailing, I would have thought his parents would have known at first sight of him they had an auctioneer on their hands. People, he cried happily, I was about fifteen and heard Fred R Rupert cry a sale. I followed him around all day, spellbound, with my mouth open. I tell you people, I think I caught all the flies there were there that day. I knew then I wanted to be an auctioneer, but it was some time before he started learning it. First, he spent some years as a tenant farmer. I finally got tired of farms being sold out from under me, he said, and I went to auctioneering school. The selling brotherhood, already established, did not welcome the newcomer with open arms when he got back from school. It was pretty tough for a while, but I tell you, people, he cried, and looked at Dick as if expecting him to nod or lift a finger in a bid. I kept on, even if it was tough. Finally, one day, a woman named Job, bless her heart, came and told me she and her husband were selling out, going to Florida, and she wanted me to take charge of selling her stuff. It was a start, and with his unquenchable enthusiasm, plus the help of his wife and his son, who also wants to be an auctioneer, he became established, and now he says he is almost covered up. There's a new trend <clears throat> in eating at farm sales now, too, Dick told me on the way home. The coffee break has made itself felt there now. At the Dalton sale, the men ate in the kitchen. Then, in the afternoon, a woman came out to the barn with sandwiches and coffee. I thought the cows would run over her any minute, but she stayed until she sold everything. A farm sale is like a committee meeting now. Nobody can get down to business until everybody's had a cup of coffee. Come over, said Ruth, Ruth Fife, driving away after we had visited pleasantly at the road's edge in front of our mailbox. This is the traditional farewell greeting of farm neighbors who have met any time, any place. It is sincere. It is also a convention, just as when you ask somebody how old how are you? You don't expect them to tell you.
In the modern changing pattern of life on a family farm, this greeting is more of a wish than an actual expression, expectation, which when she stopped, Ruth had been on her way home from a job in town where she works three and a half or four days a week. She has weekends free. I have to let things go at home to do this, confessed the this immaculate housekeeper. She lives in the big, pink-roofed, white colonial house her grandparents built on the 80-acre family-sized farm adjoining this family-sized farm. Her husband always has some cattle on the farm and a job in town. He is a good mechanic, Russell used to say. I'll be out here with you fellows someday milking cows. But now he has two, jo two town jobs. One, a welding job, begins at noon. The second begins at one o'clock in the morning. This system, by which owners of small farms are able to continue living on them, is one of the reasons the old-time pleasant custom of leisurely neighborhood visits died down to diminuendo. One reason the Home Economics Club suspended in this community was that many of the women had taken jobs. Granted, too, there came a time when the extension lessons were merely a repetition of what most farm women already knew or could learn at leisure from the farm magazines. One of the Ruth's sons and his wife and children have parked a house trailer in the field just outside of the neat picket fence. This son and his young wife both have town jobs, and they take the children to a babysitter as they go into town. The other son has a country place a short distance farther away. He has two children, both in school. His wife has held a town job since they were married, and he had a town job and also does some custom trucking in his spare time. Ruth and Russell do not try to raise fruit or farm crops. Russell rents his fields to another farmer, but they always have a fine vegetable garden, neat as a washed meat platter. When I met her at the roadside, Ruth told me they had had guests from out of the state over the weekend, and she had... feasted them on the first fruits of the garden. We had new beets, new carrots, new peas, new potatoes, new green beans, and lettuce, she said, and smiled a smile of quiet satisfaction. Ruth is pretty and one of the kid kindest persons I know. A garden helps the budget even more important. It eases a country woman's conscience for leaving her house to take a town job. Also, finally, it rests her spirit. Suddenly realizing it was nearly supper time, Ruth said, Well, come over. Oh, I will, I promised, and you come. Summer is that lovely season of overwork and garden abundance when every farm woman has too much of something, and therefore her neighbor, who has none, has enough. A perfect policy for small neighborly farming communities, unfortunately difficult to apply on an international scale. The canning season has seemed endless, said Martha Weymouth, whose husband is a farmer and a government accountant. They live in a pleasant old farmhouse on a large farm in an adjoining county. Martha, who is also a writer, has temporarily escaped from the kitchen to the typewriter to write a letter. Today we'll use the last of the glass jars and I'm just about to say to the tomatoes. The rest of you just rot and see if I care. Where I'm going to get jars for garden huckleberries I don't know but these I just can't let waste. Besides I do love gloating over my beautifully crowded cellar shelves. At church, Jean Morgan said, I got rid of three bushels of green beans today. She looked triumphant as if getting rid of the beans were the reason for raising them. I've canned all the green beans and tomatoes I'm going to can, said Mary Naylor, 
whose canning for a family of six runs into the hundreds of courts. The Naylors have three sons and a daughter and live on an 80-acre farm. Clyde and the boys rent out 210 acres more in other places and spend a good deal of time farming on the road. I'm freezing corn now, continued Mary, and I'm not going to make any mixed pickle. We love it, but I made so much last year we have plenty left over. Probably the reason farm women go on canning and freezing their garden's offerings after the cellar shelves and freezers are full is from a sense of noblesse oblige established when they planted their gardens. A garden is a truce with nature, by which gardeners have some rights but not many, and these subject to recall without notice. One rule is that if a tomato, for example, can put its heart into making a crop, the least a farm woman can do is see that it goes to a good purpose. Of course, she can count on the chickens or hogs to take it on themselves once every summer to help her dispose of the garden. The trouble is they always choose the wrong time. Nature feels free to withdraw from the truce at any time and give the whole garden to some. of her other creatures, all of which are just as important to her as the farm wife is. The gardener may go out any morning to find that bean beetles have made a beech head in the bean rows while she was in the house canning the late cherries. From nature's viewpoint, even the best gardener is only a squatter and his lease is temporary. Mary was mad yesterday, said Clyde Naylor. She was mad at Bart's sow that got into the hen house and tore up things and upset the feeders and spilled the drinking water. Then she discovered Johnny's ducks were eating the blossoms off of the peas in the garden. This is partly what is meant by a family farm. Everyone in the family shares the consequences of what everyone else in the family has or does. Mary, red-haired, brown-eyed, thin and wiry, is a tolerant and forgiving person, quick to express her opinions kindly. Vengeance would have overtaken Bart's sow and Johnny's ducks, except that Mary didn't have time to dispense it just then. She had to get dinner for a hang crew. She is a good cook, quick and efficient, and likes for people to eat as if it were a pleasure. She got us an awful good dinner, said one of the hang crew, who sympathized with her even though he laughed. Mary is a graduate of Indiana State Normal School, where she majored in home economics. After that, she taught a year or so, but didn't like it as well as farm housekeeping. She is experimental and original in her housekeeping and gardening. When she plants pole beans, she plants strawberry popcorn there, so she doesn't have to set bean poles. When the beans are gone, the popcorn is ripe, attractively dark red and sellable, so she makes some money from her bean supports. She makes decisions quickly and never regrets them afterward. She likes to watch television while she irons. Of course, I iron in a few wrinkles, but what's the difference? She says, laughing. Every year, Mary and Clyde go on a vacation by themselves and without telling anybody where they are going. She is forthright in a way many women can envy. One when she ha Once when she had a dinner, Reddy and Clyde and the boys were unaccountably and unreasonably late. She waited a while, then took the dinner and threw it into the backyard. It takes courage as well as wrath to do that. Mary is able to go to church every Sunday morning and yet serve a good dinner, promptly and without nervous haste, almost as soon as she and the family get home. The secret of this efficiency, she explained, with a characteristic Mary Naylor laugh, I just have the same menu every Sunday. It's beef and potatoes, green beans and carrots, and chocolate cake. No matter what else you do, your image is incomplete unless you collect something, 
It can be anything from old tractor parts to family history. You may not have anything to say about what it will be. The choice is something bestowed on you as unsought as rain. One year, in silo filling time, I suddenly discovered I was a collector of persimmon pudding recipes. In this farming community, the silo filling dinner is about the last remaining harvest dinner. Farmers like it, even though they dread it. On that day, an astounding investment in farm machinery, tractors, wagons, field choppers, blowers, trucks, cars are gathered at one farm. Thanks to farm freezers, quick fuel stove, refrigerators, packaged food, running water in the kitchen, and easier farm chores in general, the preparation of a silo filling dinner is not the great chore it used to be. In an earlier day, a farm wife's neighbors came to help because she really needed the help. Everything had to be prepared that morning. Now much of the work can be done long before. A farm wife has frozen pie, meats, rolls, and vegetables in the freezer. The women who come to help simply make a bright holiday out of a work day. The food is good and of banquet-sized quantities. Hazel Dutton had offered to help me get the silo-filling dinner that week, and she suggested having persimmon pudding for dessert, in addition, of course, to ice cream and some kind of pie. She has persimmon trees in her yard whereof the fruit is large, sweet, never puckery, even before frost, and I have some persimmons in the freezer. Already put through the colander, she offered generously, I'll bring you some when I come to church tomorrow, and I'll bring you Floyd Reynolds' recipe that makes a big pudding.